the, the title of the hearing is Perspectives from Main Street, COVID-19's Impact on Small Business. There's no doubt that this pandemic has impacted our lives in every way imaginable. For some, the impact has been tragically on their health or the health of a loved one. Um, I personally know multiple families, uh, including uh, someone who was my physician for a period of time who recently passed away as a result of, of this. Uh, for others, it's affected their day-to-day -day way of life. Uh, virtually no impact of our day-to-day -day life that hasn't been altered by it. And of course, for some, that means they've lost their jobs or they've lost their businesses. And it, the economic fallout from this uh, pandemic has had an unprecedented historic impact on millions of Americans. By April of this year, the unemployment rate had increased to 14.7%. Only two months before that, in February, the unemployment rate was only 3.5%. In the first quarter of this year, the United States saw a 5% decrease, decrease in the annual real GDP rate compared to the fourth quarter of 2019, which reported a 2.1% increase. And our nation's small businesses have, without a doubt, been among the hardest hit, I would argue the hardest hit from an economic perspective by this pandemic. The Small Business Administration estimates that in 2019, nearly 30 million small firms were operating in the United States, and they employed about 47% of all the workers in our country, or amounts to about 60 million Americans. Now, after this pandemic, it's estimated that 54%, so over half of those small business jobs are considered what you would call highly vulnerable. And I think that's especially true in industries like uh, hotels and accommodation, the food service industry. As I've said, I believe that those industries, unfortunately, will be the first ones into the crisis and the hardest ones to get out of it. Uh, there was a recent SNAP survey by the Census Bureau, and it reported uh, in data that they collected between April 26th and the 2nd of May that 83.5%, 83 83.5% .5 of small businesses that were surveyed within this industry of accommodations and food service, they reported that they had experienced a very large negative effect due to the pandemic. And of course, um, I don't think any of us from an anecdotal and real life perspective needed the Census Bureau to do that in order for us to know that. Um, but I think this is true in, in multiple sectors across our economy. That same survey suggests that throughout the month of May, the number of firms reporting large negative impact had decreased from more than 51% of firms to 45% of, fir of firms. Um, similarly, the number of small businesses having reported decreased revenue or decrease in employees has also gone down in the last four weeks. And as these statistics have decreased, the number of firms having reported that they received financial assistance in the form of either a paycheck protection loan uh, or an economic injury disaster loan or grant have begun to increase substantially. So according to the most recent data provided by the Small Business Administration, whose administrator, along with the secretary, I hope, of the Treasury, will be here next week um, before this committee. According to their data, there's more than 4.4 million PPP loans that have been made for a total of over $510 billion. The average loan size is now about $114,000. So I think when we look at those numbers, particularly the average loan of $114,000, I think that's what those of us who crafted this program had envisioned. Uh, what the program would look like when all was said and done. There's also more than 700,000 uh, emergency injury disaster loans that have been made for $55 billion, although that program, of course, has had its own set of complications, uh, as has been well documented. While, while the process of establishing and administering the PPP program was not without faults, uh, as would be expected from a program that is brand new and of this size and scope, uh, crafted over six days and implemented, you know, with the rules and so forth over six days, that we have to remember that on April 3rd of this year was the first time ever that anyone in the world had ever applied for a PPP loan, processed a PPP loan, or approved one. So despite all of that, the program has had immense and positive impact on the small business community. The program was created to provide these small businesses and their employees with emergency funding so they could sustain their business, particularly their payroll, during the uncertainty of this time. It was designed to allow them to keep their workers on payroll and, and to make it possible for firms to once again be able to operate after the crisis had passed. So following the passage of the CARES Act, demand for the program was unbelievably high. I think it exceeded everyone's expectations. It was so high that the first round of funding 
uh, we reached the guarantee cap in less than two weeks, and it required Congress to come back and appropriate another $310 billion. Millions of additional small businesses, in addition to independent contractors and sole proprietors, were able to participate due to this additional funding. There was a recent survey by the National Federation of Independent Business. It noted that 77% of surveyed small business owners had applied for a PPP loan, of which 93% had received their funding. Just speaking for my home state of Florida, we have approximately 336,000 PPP loans for more than 30 billion. Each one of those loans represents a business surviving and a worker receiving a paycheck during this incredibly trying time. It's a lifeline to American business who has suffered through no fault of their own. And these statistics are, of course, encouraging, but we recognize that small firms and communities throughout our nation are still struggling. Just last week, uh, the Small Business Administration and the Treasury Department announced that they would be increasing their efforts to ensure that the PPP program is successful in reaching small businesses in all of our nation's communities by agreeing to set aside an additional $10 billion of PPP funds for Community Development Financial Institutions, or CDFIs for short. This effort to improve CDFIs' ability to administer PPP loans and to set aside funding for their use is meant to, to hopefully ensure that underserved communities uh, can better access the benefits of the program. Uh, this is work of, of uh, tremendous importance. Um, the, the ranking member and, and, and many others were very involved in making this possible, and, and I also thank for the SBA and the Treasury uh, for moving on this uh, uh, after hearing all these requests. I want to close by saying I think it's impossible to gather here today and, and on any topic and not acknowledge what we have seen take place uh, across the country, including in my hometown of Miami and my home state of Florida, but right here where we work in Washington, D.C., as well as in New York City and Minneapolis, California, all across the country. I don't think uh, anyone can dispute that uh, the murder of Mr. Floyd was an outrage and a crime, and that there must be justice and accountability for it. I do think, however, that for far too long in this nation, we, we have ignored the fact that a significant percentage of the American family feels like their lives are not valued to the same extent, and their problems are ignored because of the color of their skin. No nation can be successful when a substantial percentage of your population feels that they are treated unfairly as a matter of course. This comes not, the, the anger and the frustration that we see is, is not, I believe, not simply isolated uh, to one very tragic instance of a murder, but it goes beyond it. And it's more than just the other incidents that we have seen pile up over the years. I think it also includes issues like the already disproportionate harm to communities of color, which have come about as a result of this pandemic and of other economic uh, situations that have emerged that have led to what, when you look at the numbers, are clearly disparities and inequities in our society that fall along racial and ethnic lines. And so, in the context of the jurisdiction of this committee, ensuring that the worker-focused economic relief of the PPP makes it to small business in these communities was a priority before the last few days and I think takes on heightened importance now. The work of this committee has its own part to play in helping address the economic disparities facing uh, Americans of color during this crisis and beyond. And so I want to thank the ranking member for his longstanding and continued leadership in advocating for underserved communities and for his partnership on this front. I look forward to continuing that partnership. I think it takes on an added urgency because this cannot be another one of those instances in which we turn the page and move forward without addressing the lingering cancer that hangs over us of racial inequality in our country, which is, includes, obviously, how, the, how minority communities feel they're treated by authorities, but isn't just limited to that. Today's hearing will allow members of the committee the opportunity to explore what the small business landscape currently looks like in various industries and in various communities. And while this is our first formal committee hearing following the passage of the CARES Act, it will certainly not be our last. Uh, I assure everyone that while I have taken on a, a second job for the same pay, base pay um, that I was getting before, I remain actively engaged along with the members of this committee and the ranking member and so many other great partners in oversight over the implementation of the programs in Title I of the CARES Act, and we are committed 
to continuing to conduct vigorous oversight over these programs to make sure that they're operating the way Congress intended, including addressing the issues of fraud and the misuse of funds, which always comes every time uh, government provides assistance of any kind. Our oversight efforts, as I said, are going to continue next week on the 10th of June, when this committee will welcome the SBA Administrator and the Treasury Secretary for our next hearing. And with that, I want to now recognize the Ranking Member, Senator Cardin.